and welcome to Stacktastic, the monthly web show for the avid comic book reader and those who aspire to become so. Now, for today's episode, where I'll again be covering 10 different topics, I have a theme, and that's female characters in comics. Uh, let's hope I don't regret it. Uh, now, as many of you know, I am a big fan of diversity in all different mediums of entertainment because I feel that it should reflect those who are enjoying it. But that doesn't mean that in the pursuit of that diversity, sometimes companies and creative uh, pers personas who are uh, putting these things up there can't go a little bit too far. So we're going to celebrate some things and we're going to be concerned about some things and I'm going to probably, as you'll see, outright dislike some things. So let's get started with one of the most popular uh, characters uh, going on right now. Some say the most popular character in comics who's a woman, uh, or just any character perhaps, and that's Harley Quinn. Uh, I thought it was very interesting that DC decided to make February uh, the previous month Harley Quinn month. Uh, they had all these uh, variant covers uh, featuring her uh, as interpreted by different artists. Some were excellent. I would say my favorite cover was the Amanda Connor cover where Harley gets ready to race the Flash in a chariot pulled by cheetahs uh, with her, of course, wearing a helmet because safety first. Uh, I thought that was really fun and, and in perfect spirit with the character. Uh, some of the other artists I thought got it right, uh, but then it, it brought up a, a new problem and there was this one cover where it looked like Harley had, hardly, uh, hardly had any pants on at all. And I was like, wow! Now, first Wonder Woman without any pants, and now Harley Quinn? Who would ever think that I would be able to create a list of people I wish wore pants? And, you know, it's the same conversation we often have about, well, you know, the male characters are objectified as well, and they're wearing skin-tight costumes. But this is going beyond a skin-tight outfit, and I think that if they were drawing male characters in essentially thongs all the time uh, and nothing else, uh, you too would eventually start to be like, enough is enough already. Uh, and so I think that they're taking certain things at work and potentially running them into, into the ground by applying them to other characters. People don't want pants on Wonder Woman? Fine. But I think Harley Quinn uh, has gone from wearing a full unitard to basically wearing, you know, as little clothing as she can get away with. And so uh, I wish that DC Editorial would see that cover and be like, Hey, dude, get your pencil. You got to draw in some, like, at least boy shorts, right? Uh, but I did, do think that uh, there are a lot of good things coming out of the Harley Quinn renaissance, I guess you could say. I'm excited for the movie with Margot Robbie in the role. Uh, I also think it was interesting, and this was uh, advertised in the back of DC Comics last month, that Hot Topic introduced a line of clothing uh, centered around Harley Quinn. I thought that was so great, and it was so nice to see a comic book property uh, promoted on such a wide scale in such a mainstream way. And I have to say, some of the items available for purchase are pretty cool. I've actually provided a link in the video description if you want to check them out for yourself. They've got glasses, they've got buttons, they have bags. They also have some pretty cool leggings that I thought were very um, indicative of the Harley Quinn look uh, while still making it something you could wear in your everyday life without looking like you belong in Arkham. Uh, so I thought it was great uh, to see the character uh, not only being so successful within the comic book industry, but perhaps being a gateway character to people who don't like comics but like Harley Quinn, and then maybe we can pull them in. And thankfully, I think the Harley Quinn comic is pretty good right now. I really like what Jimmy Palmiotti and Amanda Connor, real-life couple, uh, are doing with the character. I think she's a lot of fun. I think they walk a lot of fine lines of being able to uh, deliver a Harley to many different audiences. And I think Harley's been splintered, and people see her in different ways now. And I think the comic does a really good job of appealing to everybody. I really like it. It's often at the top of my stack. I always purchase it when it comes out. And I also really like the specials they're doing for holidays. I think they're a lot of fun. The Valentine's Day one was particularly fun uh, and a great way to see Batman interact with Harley. It reminded me a little bit of some of the episodes of the animated series. Really stellar stuff. All right, so that's the first topic, Harley Quinn. Next, I want to talk about Lady Thor. Uh, I talked about Lady Thor in my last Sacktastic. I thought it was off to a pretty good start, but I was really appalled by the latest issue. Not the annual, uh, which was okay, but I didn't like the latest issue where we saw Lady Thor take on the Absorbing Man and Titania. And basically, at the end of the fight, Titania said, you're the new Lady Thor? You know, I have so much respect for what you're doing and what this stands for in terms of, like, the glass ceiling with superheroes. I'm paraphrasing. Uh, but then she's like, I'm going to, you know what, I'm going to surrender. You can have this one. You, and then Lady Thor is like, you realize I have to send you to jail, right? I'm not going to just let you guys walk away. And Titania's like, oh, it's okay. 
Jail time will do us some good. We need a break. Uh, absorbing man, my husband, he has a wandering eye. Prison usually uh, settles that up. And I'd be like, Titania, are you aware of what happens in prison? <clears throat> but anyway, I thought that was just too on the nose. It was too self-referential, and it was a little bit too much of Marvel giving itself a pat on the back, being like, we did good, didn't we? We have a Lady Thor. And I'm like, if you're going to have a Lady Thor, just have a Lady Thor. I don't need to have characters commenting on it. And it just, I think it just really it takes you out of the narrative of the comic. You're like, I'm trying to read a fictional story here, and now you're making, you know, commentary, self-referential commentary on uh, what you're doing with the character. And then also, I think it makes the character somehow seem, you know, not legitimate. Uh, is she just a token? Uh, and, you know, it's the same with their conversations with the All-Mother, Thor's mom. Uh, you know, the All-Mother being like, oh, you go, girl. I love my son, but I support what you're doing. And I'm like, just hit stuff. Uh, we'll see. Also, on a side note, who else has realized Lady Thor actually doesn't have that very many skills, but instead just allows uh, Mjolnir to roam free? And Mjolnir, I think when she wins the day, it often consists of her just throwing Mjolnir and then Mjolnir going to town. And it's just like, you didn't really contribute anything. I guess Thor just has a stronger grip on Mjolnir. Who knows? Maybe Thor doesn't allow Mjolnir to be itself, doesn't allow Mjolnir to be totally comfortable in its own its own uh, metal skin. Uh, we'll see. So I've had some problems with the way that story is developing. Uh, now, something else I'm not a fan of. I don't like uh, bisexual Catwoman. I'm sorry. I know some people were very excited to hear this news, but I would have to say that on the surface of it, it kind of makes sense. She comes from a prostitution background, so she's very, you know, in touch with her sexuality. Uh, you know, she's someone who is often willing to do whatever it takes uh, to get what she wants. And, you know, sometimes when you blur the line uh, professionally, it, it, it gets blurred personally. So I can understand where it comes from creatively. But I have to say, it's just too much. You know, I really supported uh, Batwoman being a lesbian. I thought that that not only was a, a great choice uh, in terms of bringing diversity to the comic books, but also I thought the way that it was explored and organically put into the character's origin story was fantastic. That she was uh, a victim of don't ask, don't tell in the military. Uh, and so she stood up for herself and she didn't want to live a lie, so she found a different way to serve. Fantastic. Uh, and I thought that, you know, it was a good way to use Maggie Sawyer in their relationship. Although I do think that, I've, as I've discussed uh, recently over on Beyond the Trailer, Batwoman's personal life has taken uh, center stage instead of her vigilante career. And I think that that's kind of sidelined the character, or at least sidetracked it. Uh, I think that she's really lost her way in terms of her uh, goal professionally, uh, and which is unfortunate. You never want to see any character become just a token or a poster boy or poster woman for anything. And that's kind of what I see happening for a lot of these characters. Uh, but then also, Harley and Ivy are bisexual, and that's been referenced a couple of times, at least for each other. I think Harley has, I mean, uh, Ivy has no sexuality, because uh, she's a plant, basically. Uh, but I think that Harley, I think Harley's only really uh, interested romantically in when it comes to women in Poison Ivy. And that, that's because they have a special, unique relationship. And you know what? Sometimes you just click with someone in a way that you wouldn't expect, even though it's not a rule that you would apply to your entire life and everyone you meet. I get that. And I think it's an interesting commentary on their relationship. And it's something that Paul Dini has clearly intended, based on a lot of the comic book work he's done post the animated series, where he obviously couldn't really get into that too much because it was supposed to be for an all-ages audience. Uh, but that's three uh, characters who are open and, uh, you know, ex adventurous in their sexuality. I see no reason to add a third. And it just creates a situation where Batman's like, whoa, every woman I know, you know, is, uh, you know, at least has lesbian tendencies. Is it me? And then also, if I, he should tell Dick Grace, Grace and I'd be like, well, watch out for Barbara. She could be making an announcement any day now. And I, you know, and I know a lot of people you know, and I'm sensitive to the fact that a number of people, when it was announced that Catwoman was bisexual, they were like, oh, wow, finally a role model. And it's like, hey, you've already got Batwoman. You've got Harley and Ivy. You've got Korra now over the over in the Legend of Korra and uh, Asami, uh, Asami. You have all these uh, characters. You know, it's like, what's left for those of us who are straight? Where's my role model character? And I mentioned that before with the Korra situation. And some people said, well, hey, why can't Cora still be a role model for you if she happens to be a lesbian? But I would say, well, I understand what you're saying, and I still like Cora, I still like Batwoman, I still like Harley and Ivy, but by the same, uh, you know, argument, why can't you still like Catwoman if she's straight? You know, why does she need to be bisexual for you to think that she, you know, it's the same thing. You know, whatever you're applying to me should apply to you. And I just feel, you know, 
uh, there's diversity and then there's tokenism and just trying to get buzz for a character and you know what's left for me to relate to as a, a straight female reader. It's frustrating. It's it's frustrating and I, I don't like it and I think, you know, the Catwoman comic has been on a slippery slope downward because of such horrible writers that are assigned to it and that they would allow a writer to do this with the character just at, on a whim, I think is, is just really, really annoying to me. Super annoying. But I, you know, I don't want anyone to get upset with me because I'm totally supportive of these other characters. It's just, it's too much. It's, it's, it's leaving nothing on the table uh, for those of us who happen to be straight. All right, so that's the third story of the day. Now, the fourth, let's talk about the A-Force announcement, and that's the all-female Avengers title. Uh, now, I'd be more excited about this if the all-female X-Men title had turned out to be a better read. I was very excited about that comic. Fantastic lineup, fantastic creative team. But that creative team never really gelled. I think they never really quite knew what to do with the lineup and the idea of the book. Uh, they had Jubilee adopt a baby, and that was basically about it. And then otherwise, you know, the stories were no different, except there just weren't any guys around. Uh, and I thought that that just came off actually as a little bit sexist. You were like, I like the X-Men being a mix of everybody. You know, that's one of the strengths. It's uh, how it plays off of its soap opera roots. Uh, that, you know, it's not all women. It's women and men and how they react as friends and lovers, etc. And, you know, that dynamic is lost from the X-Men. And it also never really focused on any of the characters. It still was a team book. Uh, and I would almost prefer a title that instead focused on female characters uh, you know, and, and change them up every couple of issues. You know, like this arc is about uh, Captain Marvel. Now we're going to talk about She-Hulk. And I liked the She-Hulk book, by the way, which apparently is over. Uh, but, uh, oh well, I guess it wasn't selling well. Who knows exactly why they decided to end it. Uh, but I would be more excited for A-Force if I thought that they had a better track record, Marvel, in this diversity uh, book department. For instance, I also was excited about Mighty Avengers, uh, the largely black Avengers team that Luke Cage founded. Uh, that had caught off to a great start as well. But it also never really went anywhere and had trouble finding its voice. I think the books couldn't decide if they were about their diversity or if they just happen to be diverse. Uh, and I think if you're going to make a book that's clearly celebrating uh, a different gender or ethnicity, you have to celebrate that gender or ethnicity or there's no point for the book, right? Uh, I don't know. Uh, Quality-wise, all these books are not that great, so I'm nervous for A-Force when it comes out. But I will pick it up. I will buy it. All right, the fifth story, Spider-Gwen. We had a lot of new books launched uh, with a female lead. Uh, this was one of them. Uh, I liked the other one I'm going to talk about next. This one, I had trouble getting into it. And I, that's, that's because I didn't pick up the Spider-Gwen you know, miniseries that was uh, introduced her character during the Spider-Verse when she was just going to be an alternate reality character. Uh, I thought that Spider-Gwen looks cool. I like having Gwen Stacy around. I have to say, though, that w reading her after first reading the Batgirl redux, uh, with ha her being in Brooklyn or Burnside, as they're calling it, this seemed kind of like a lighter version of that. And so I think it suffers by the, it suffers through the comparison, which uh, I think they should get on that on the Spider-Gwen team. But again, it was really hard for me to get into it because they were relying so much on backstory for this first issue. And I wish that the editor had said, this is a number one, a lot of new readers are going to be coming on the scene. Uh, I think we need to make sure this is accessible to them. For instance, uh, the whole thing about Peter Parker, I didn't understand what was going on there. Uh, the whole Mary Janes is a band. I didn't realize until halfway through that discussion that Gwen was once on the band. And I just feel that there uh, was just too much, that, that, too much guesswork for me. So I ended up not being a big fan of that title. I'll still continue to pick it up, give it a few more tries. I did like Silk a lot, though, and that's number seven today. I thought Silk was an excellent debut. I really am starting to like this character. Uh, I think she has a lot of humility. I think it's great to see an Asian character. You know, so many times we talk about diversity and people are like, what about, uh, you know, Latino characters or Asian characters? And here's an Asian character who I think has the potential to be up there with maybe Psylocke as a really popular Asian character that really is able to stick around and, you know, uh, withstand the test of time. Uh, I think she's uh, much more appealing to me than any of the other sp uh, female Spider-Man Spider characters. Spider-Man. Spider-Man characters they've had. Uh, I like her backstory. I've been there from the beginning. Although I'm curious. That's a good point. If you have been with Silk from the beginning, did you find this book just as hard to get into as I did with Spider-Gwen? Uh, but I also really like the art on this title. I thought that was a lot of fun. I thought it fit very well with the character and also the female demographic that they're obviously targeting. But I think at the same time it was still male friendly. I like her setup that she works at the Fact Channel, you know, loosely Fox News where J. Jonah Jameson is uh, situated. 
Uh, and I just think that the mystery involving her family was very good. I also liked that they talked about, you know, her having a regret in the way she lashed out at her parents, not knowing what would be the last time she saw them. And I thought that was very interesting as well. Uh, so I'm excited about this title very much so, and I'm definitely going to continue to read it. Uh, next, well, oh, that was six, sorry, seven. New Batgirl. Let's talk about Batgirl. I'm continuing to love this title. Uh, I love the setting for Burnside. I think it's very Barbara Gordon. But this is a great title. They, first of all, I'm so impressed how much they can jam-pack into each issue in terms of story, character development, personal and professional A and B storylines. You know, Barbara has quite the busy dating life. Uh, also, they are very good at sowing the seeds for the next story arc and the current story arc. So it really, you know, it's, you, you never feel like there's a, a pause in the story. But also visually, the art here is so amazing. Uh, the whole team uh, works very well together to create this comic, and I just love what they're doing. I think it feel, feels very real, a little almost image comics-y. And of course, uh, there's been the word on the street that DC is aware of how successful this rebranding is, and they're trying to quote-unquote Batgirl a number of other properties at the public publisher, that Batgirling has become a verb over there. Uh, let's see, I wouldn't want them all to have the exact same tone as Batgirl, but it works very well for this character. I love it. I'm curious, though, how do other people enjoy it? And also, male readers, do you like this book as much as it appeals to a female reader like myself? Because it does focus a lot on her dating life uh, and a lot of, you know, like the trials and tribulations of being a young woman in the city and she and Black Canary are having a fight because, you know, uh, you know they're, they're friends, BFFF, you know, maybe not, uh, etc., etc. So I, I think it's very, very girly, which I like, but I question how it, trend, how it can handle itself um, in a broader market. All right, so next, Princess Leia got a comic. I read the Princess Leia comic. Uh, I like the creative team uh, in terms of Mark Wade, the writer. Terry Dodson, not a big fan of his artwork. Uh, it's a little too cheesecakey for me, and also everything, every woman looks the same. I'm like, thank goodness you all have different hair colors, or I'd be lost. Uh, but I do think that, you know, obviously he's a very popular artist, and I, I respect that other people like his work. Uh, so anyway, uh, they, I thought the book had good, 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 good things about it and bad things. Uh, I liked that it explored the importance of royalty to a people. You know, Princess Leia was like, you don't need a princess. But then someone from Alderaan was like, no, you know, it's an important part of our culture. It means a lot to me. I want to preserve it. And so I thought that was great to show it from that perspective. I liked also that Princess Leia teamed up with a female character. Uh, she spent so much time with guys in the movies, it was nice to see her get her own BFFF, uh, a la, you know, Black Canary, I guess, and Barbara Gordon. Uh, but they're very different ca uh, characters. It'll be interesting to see how uh, they get along. I thought some of the writing was pretty sloppy for Mark Wade. If I had to guess that if someone said this was written by Mark Wade, I'd be like, no, it's not. And then I'd read the uh, credits and I'd be like, oh, it is. Uh, the reason I say that is because, you know, there's a point at the end of the comic when Princess Leia is like, look, Evan, or however you pronounce her name, it's Evan with an extra A. Um, be honest with me. I want you to always tell me the truth. And so finally Evan's like, okay, here's the truth. And then Princess Leia's like, okay, that's enough for now. Uh, no more truth for now. And it's like, Whoa, what are you talking about? You know, it's like you just said to be honest and truthful. I think if I were Evan, I'd be like I would keep I would keep going with it. I'd be like, you just told me to say what I'm thinking, and now you're shutting me up. What's with that? But then I guess she has too much respect for royalty. Uh, I did, you know, I, I think the character a little a little bit too spunky. Uh, you know, I think that that's a problem with female characters. If you watch my commentary on comics regularly, you'll know that I don't like when female characters are like Oh yeah, I just did that in your face, male characters. I'm better than all of you because I'm a woman. Girl power! And I'm just like, barf. Uh, can't you just be a normal person like everyone else? So that this comic had a, a, tad, a tad of that mixed in there. I also don't like how the Star Wars comics overall are relying so heavily on the movies. Like, they're trying to recreate sequences from the movies. Like, for instance, I also read, read Darth Vader. Not a woman, but we'll allow it because it's a Star Wars comic as well. And they have a whole interaction with him in Jabba the Hutt. And I'm like, you're just trying to remind me of the Jabba the Hutt sequence from Return of the Jedi. And then here they have a hologram message from Princess Leia again. And I'm like, okay, I get it. That's the one, like the one she sends to Obi-Wan Kenobi. Uh, and it's just like, you know what? Just have the uh, self-confidence to explore other things and create your own mythology. And they're like, we've been instructed not to do that because, as you know, they totally erased the... Uh, the Star Wars expanded universe for the new movies. So maybe that's the marching orders they're getting, but right now the comics, again, as so often with movie-based comics, they feel more like promotional material than something that exists in its own right. I hope that changes. I'm still picking them up, 
Uh, I don't think Star Wars number two is... Oh, it did come out. Yeah, it did come out. I don't like the art on any of the titles, by the way. They picked all my least favorite artists. John Cassidy, Salvador La Roca, uh, Terry Dodson. I'm just like, ugh, not, not a fan. All right, so next up, Angela. I was really surprised. Uh, they have an Angela comic. Uh, she has her own uh, comic as well. Is this like a digital comic? I'm not sure because I saw that a new one was coming out when I was checking the, you know, Comixology only opens at like, I don't know, 9.30 a.m. or 10 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. So sometimes I'm in the office early and I was trying to buy my comics like at 8 a.m. and they hadn't refreshed. So I went over to Midtown Comics' website to see the different comics that were available for the day. You know, kind of like a, ooh, coming attractions. What am I going to get today? And one was Angela of Asgard's comic on uh, number four. And I was like, number four? That's right, I do remember picking up number one. Where's two and three? So I went back over to Comixology. I found them. Uh, but then when they refreshed the titles for the day, the new releases, lo and behold, number four wasn't there. So I had to go and search for number four on the site. I found it. But I think a lot of people aren't aware of this comic. Maybe it's a glitch. And that's why also maybe I ask if it's a digital release. It was really disappointing because I enjoyed the first issue very much so. And I enjoyed the Angela miniseries where it introduced her as uh, the sister to Thor and Loki. Uh, I think the character has a lot of potential. I like what they've been doing with her. I like when she was over in Guardians of the Galaxy. They took her out of Guardians of the Galaxy, though, I guess, to bring her more over into Asgard. But I liked her in Guardians of the Galaxy. I liked her friendship with Gamora. And, by the way, speaking of sexuality, I thought it seemed pretty heavily hinted at that she and Gamora had kind of a flirtation going on. I don't know if Gamora just, you know, was being polite and liked uh, Angela only as a friend, and so she allowed the flirtation. Uh, or maybe it was, uh, you know, on both sides. We'll never know now, at least not from the, for the time being, because Angela's off on her own adventures. Uh, but I do wonder, maybe they had to remove Angela because... What role did that leave for Gamora, right? They're kind of the same character. These, like, uh, deadly assassins who are very cold and, you know, uh, have trouble relating to people on a personal level. It's like, well, how can you have both? Uh, I thought they, I thought Brian Michael Bendis was kind of making it work, actually. Uh, but I guess that uh, they got the marching orders to move the t character over to her own title. But I like Angela. I think she has a lot of potential. I'm excited to read. I didn't get to read the issues because I've got three to read uh, before I film this. But I am enjoying her quite a bit, and I'm excited to read them. So I'm curious to what you guys think about Angela is doing in the Marvel Universe. And then, number 10, Medusa. Medusa has always had her fans, but she's always been kind of a side character in the Inhumans. But I think they've been working very hard to develop her as a character, especially ever since Black Bolt was MIA uh, after he let off the Terrigen bomb. Uh, and Medusa has been kind of one of the lead characters, if not the lead, in the Inhumans new comic. Uh, and I think it's been going quite well. But I wonder, I wonder if the reason that she's so heavily focused on, and also she shows up in other comics when they have crossovers and they bring over an Inhuman, it's Medusa. And I've seen her on a couple of cover, uh, covers for uh, comics that are coming up. And I'm wondering if this is because she's going to be a major character in the upcoming movie. Uh, and that might be because Black Bolt doesn't speak. So they're like, okay, we need someone to be a character that, you know, is someone who can have lines. And perhaps they're setting up Medusa for that kind of a big role to play in the Inhumans movie and I think 2019 it might be pushed to 2020 at this point because of the Spider-Man change but it's a ways off but I'm wondering you know if maybe this would be a great role for Jessica Chastain she said very very strongly that she wants to be part of a comic book uh, cinematic universe hopefully Marvel she's met with Marvel uh, and I think with her red hair and I think she's very good at portraying like a regal persona I think she'd be a very good Medusa she's on the small side uh, you know, but they can always do tricks in terms of height I'm talking about. But they can always do camera tricks, and also she's supposed to mostly be about the hair, right? But I think she has very strong features that can counterbalance so much hair. And I think if you've seen uh, A Most Violent Year, she's kind of like Black Bolt's wife in that movie as well. And I think she does a very, very good job. So that would be my pick. Uh, and I think look for Medusa to be playing a major role in the Marvel Cinematic Universe when they start to get to the cosmic movies with Infinity War. So I'm curious, are you enjoying Medusa the way she's depicted in the comic? Uh, I love the fight she recently had with Black Bolt. I thought that was very, very good. Uh, what do you think of the idea of her having a stronger role in the movies? And also, if they make an Inhuman, well, they are making an Inhumans movie, but if they make it focused around Medusa, will you be like, what the hell? I'm all about Black Bolt. I don't care about Medusa. She's the eye candy on the throne. Uh, so thank you so much. Those are the 10 topics of the day. I hope you've enjoyed this 
uh, you know, sur survey of women or female characters in comics. I'm very curious to see what you think. Uh, now, of course, it's important to remember that still a lot of guys are reading comics, so I'm very, very curious to how you guys feel about this uh, female renaissance uh, in terms of female characters and readers to some degree in the, in the medium. And also, uh, female readers, do you feel that we're headed in the right direction? Or do you agree with me that some things are good, but some things are not so good? So leave your thoughts down below. Thank you so much for tuning in, uh, and happy reading.